Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. Are you feeling like you want to stop the world and start all over again? Well, welcome to part two of a continuing conversation with consciousness researcher, publisher, teacher and author Penny Kelly on the current disintegrating state of world affairs, how we got here, the reality we know, the interconnectedness between human consciousness and the new consciousness that we need to create if we and our planet are to survive. All of which is addressed in Penny's latest book, The Revival, Path to a New Earth, New Human. And today we'll be delving deeper into a few of the critical sectors that urgently need re-evaluating, including religion, science, finance, medicine, and the intricacies of ushering in the era of the new human with heightened abilities. Penny Kelly, welcome back. It's good to be here. It's a, it's a wonderful time for massive change. So, Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Stop the world. I want to start again. <laughs> I know. And we are starting again. I think I see signs finally. I've been watching for 45 years. Okay. Is, are we going there? Are we starting? Is it, is it happening? And, and now it's happening almost too fast for people to get their minds around. But I think there's enough people awake and holding the population that we can we'll make it we'll be okay so. well it's it's really exciting i mean many people are anxious and frightened but how often do we get you know the chance to take what isn't working and replace it with something entirely new that can work better that's right i mean that's a this is what's called a watershed time those don't come around very often. They certainly don't come around every lifetime. And civilizational kinds of change like, like we're seeing, um, those are very rare. So I think the last big one was in the Middle Ages. And there's a lot that's hidden about that. The history has been ruined, destroyed, distorted. But when you get into the real thing that was happening back then, you see almost the same things, the censorship, the assassinations, the changes imposed on people. And back then, they didn't have an internet. They didn't yeah. have a lot of reading capacity. Uh, it was illegal for people to read. And, and a lot of people didn't know how to read, and they didn't dare get caught with uh, anything to read. And so here we are, and uh, mm -hmm. they're, I think, using the same game plan, and it's not working very well. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, as you've said, you know, if we really, a new world is being born, and if we, we really yeah. want to survive and thrive, we must become new humans. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and we are becoming new humans. And people often ask me, what, what does that mean? What is that about? And what I tell them, and they just kind of blank, is it means that you are you have a new kind of consciousness. You have a new set of perceptions. You have all new meanings. You have new chemistry in the system. You have a new lifestyle. You might have a new partner or a different house or a way of getting through the day that is vastly different from the way you're doing it now, different yeah. attitudes, different expectations, different assumptions, all of that changes. And it doesn't all have to change at once, but little by little, the changes pile up until you sit back and say, wow, things are really very different. Yeah. yeah, and new capabilities. We mustn't forget that, you know, it's like an upgrade and all of the things yeah. that we don't know that we have the potential for 
yes. are beginning to come online. That that's true. Very often, uh, I just got asked recently, how do you how do you adjust your brainwave frequencies to go up into gamma? And I'm like, okay, I don't know. I just do it. Um, and, but once you do it, you understand the feeling state and the kind of perception that that brings, and then you just do it naturally. But, um, and I only, I thought originally I was going down, thanks to science, actually, I thought I was going down into alpha to do this work and to have these perceptions. And when some people got interested in my brainwaves and hooked me up to a bunch of computers and brainwave technology and said, okay, do your thing. And I discovered that I was way up. 30 to 40 cycles per second in gamma and had split my myself, my frequency set. The body was in alpha, but the consciousness was in gamma. And that was that is something that I can't quite explain how I do that. But I think that's one of the things we could learn from just uh, the science, the technology that we have out there. Yes. So Lots of possibilities coming. Yeah. Well, in the book, you highlight 12 main se um, sectors of civilization where we desperately need to make new choices, new de new decisions. Um, and they include all the things like government, finance, science, technology, education, medicine, etc. But let's go a little bit deeper with some of the things that we skated over in the last conversation. <laughs> let's start with science and religion because those two you know, do not have a very easy relationship. Yeah. Um, tell us tell us about, I mean, you've always set a great store by science, but when you and I had a conversation the other day, you, you, you've become quite disillusioned by the level of dishonour and corruption in that right. arena. How did it become so corrupted? I think the, it started small. I think the, the whole issue of funding was a major factor in that when scientists who retired continued to work and brought all their wisdom and created their own labs and had all their own equipment and and the um the interest they were free to pursue what they loved then the government started sending out messages that said, you will not talk about what's happening in the weather. You will not talk about what's happening with this particular system in the body. You will not discuss food and nutrition and what these uh, agricultural sprays are doing. You will not discuss any consciousness research. That is to be poo-pooed. There are no ETs, even though we had all kinds of evidence and photos and messages. And, and so the little by little, the messages went out. They were messages of suppression. The scientists that I worked with continued to like collaborate between themselves in the background, but they couldn't get published. They couldn't get fun, any funding. They didn't really want any funding because they knew it was compromised. And that just built up and built up until it sort of um, culminated, reached a peak last three, four years with the whole COVID thing. And, um, and that was where scientists had to take a stand. Either you were going to go with the story that was being put out, or you were going to stand up and say, no, that's not the case. This is what we know. This is what is happening. And so big division there. And I saw that scientific split along with the whole set of problems happening in the churches as that split between the two, what I'm going to call the two timelines. Um, we've crossed over onto a new timeline last November, beginning of November, 8th and 9th, maybe 10th, 11th, and 12th as well. Um, or we started that crossing I think we might be still in the process of crossing, but that split became very clear. Um, three years of 
of not being able to tell the truth, not being able to speak freely, uh, has brought a lot of people to a place where they just <laughs> don't believe much of anything about science. And to me, that's tragic because um, science and spirituality have to come together. And, yeah. and we need to use the science to understand, and maybe it maybe it's coming soon. Dr. Levengood and I were working on that. Um, that whole issue of what do we know and what can we learn about consciousness? And once we learn that, how can we use that? And that is, it becomes clear that consciousness is frequency and frequency creates plasma and plasma physics is unfolding and yet nobody can talk about consciousness. And so the whole repression thing around science has served to hobble the research or the coming together of science and spirituality. But in spite of that, if you're attuned and you're reading and watching and listening in that world, you can see it happening in spite of their best efforts. And it's kind of like, well, sorry guys, you know, too bad. Um, to all those fools, they're fools, really. Um, they're missing one of the greatest paths of exploration and research that is it exists at this point in time, and it involves human potential, as well as the potential to get off the planet and visit other places. We have some people who have achieved that, <laughs> but they're not saying, they can't say anything, they're not free either. And so, there's, yeah, we have a lot of pieces that are disjointed and coming together. So you know, it just amazes me how, how they think that they can go on with the cover-ups. The world is too transparent these days. I know. I was shocked when you wrote that the Journal of the American Medical Association said yeah. that as many as 50% of the scientific articles in their journal have fake, faked or made, made up data. That's right. Now, so they're admitting that and they are continuing to publish it. So they are short, shooting themselves in the foot. <laughs> you know, I call that insanity or stupidity, but yeah. they get it and they will take themselves out because of it. Yes. So once you lose trust, that's once you lose honor, then that's really it's another lifetime to yeah. get to get that back again. Yeah. So you can't risk that. And they um, there was a great deal of talk, private talk among the scientists that I got to know and, and hang out with. Um, about the people that they knew who were making the experiment or the research fit the theory they wanted. They were altering the data and they were they would get so upset about that. And they, I never saw arguments as ferocious as the arguments between the scientists, four or five scientists would get together and the, um, the need, if I can say it this way, when they got together was to be the smartest one in the room. Yeah. And they were ferocious, but that ferocity didn't even begin to touch their ferociousness and disdain for people who are altering data or making research fit the their theory. Yeah. They were absolutely like you know, they, I can't. I can't use those words that they use to describe those scientists. Um, and that has we have seen a campaign of uh, poo pooing. I guess would be a, a you know kind of a silly way of saying that there's been a lot of discrediting going on among people who are pointing out critical things things going on in the water, things happening in the air, things going on with the soil, the planet herself. Uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, we're getting there. I'll say that we're getting there to the point of realizing, okay, something awful has happened in the science and the filtering, we, you know, we need a giant global sieve 
and put all the science in that and let the true stuff you know, or maybe the crap fall through the sieve or the colander and have the real good stuff saved in the colander and that we can then go through that and fit the pieces together. And those pieces are amazing. When you put it all together, um, the science is beautiful. It's pointing in a direction that says, wow, we have a whole new concept for reality and what how does reality, how do we get from energy to matter? Literally, what are the steps? Mm -hmm. And once you get that, it's like, okay, let's play with it. Let's make some matter. Let's alter some matter on the run, on the fly, or we say on the farm, on the hoof. <laughs> so... Yeah. We need, yeah. we need to go back to childhood and really embrace, you know, the the discoveries, um, yeah. the opportunity to play, and what can you know, what can I do with this? Rather than yeah. I know what I know, and I don't want to know anything else. Oh yeah, that is one of the great features of science. There is no set finished um, thing, <laughs> nothing. They all, I remember when I first got in touch with a number of scientists and it was through Dr. Levengood. And I, I overheard a conversation or was part of a conversation about God and none of them believed in God. And I was appalled and I thought, oh, what is the matter with them? <laughs> and and so time goes on. And what I realized is none of them believed in religion. They all had some appreciation for something much greater than themselves. And they they often use that as a factor and in their own research. And then I began to hear how they came to their ideas. And these were straight out, hands down, clairvoyant moments, dreams, intuitions, mm -hmm. visions, altered perceptions. And I was like, look, you guys, you're dealing with consciousness. Are you, are you researching that? No, no. <laughs> well, they were using it. They didn't have time to research it, but they knew every one of them had some way, something. And I think the topper for me was um, one of the scientists was I uh, had a relationship with some Sasquatch in Michigan over by Eastern Michigan University and was in communication with them, Bigfoot beings. And he had inherited a, or bought or purchased, maybe, I'm not sure how he got some acreage, a big chunk of land, and went onto that land. And he uh, drove his car up to where, as far as he could get, it was forested, and uh, parked the car. And he noticed this tree down um, at this place. He thought, well, there's an entryway into the woods. And he he got out of the car, he moved this tree. It was a, a long sapling. He said it was like four or five inches in diameter and maybe 12, 15 feet long. And so he moved it and goes for a walk in the woods. And when he comes back to get in his car, that same sapling is right in front of his car again. And he's like, I swear I moved that. That was the start of a whole bunch of communication between himself and the Sasquatch on that property and the understanding of how they communicate and they do it using um, saplings, tree branches, hefty tree branches placed in certain positions that are completely unnatural and um, is still researching all of that. He, I think he wrote a small book. I don't know what the name of the book is, um, but it's uh, the the scientists, the real scientists I know, cannot be bothered with the limitations imposed on them by a government agency or a funding agency. They're like, I don't need that. I don't want that. Um, I'm not going to be told what I can think about or what I can research. 
and I will write privately. Maybe someday it will be discovered or found or understood, but I'm continuing on. Yes, I mean, and there are so many false constructs, aren't there? Um, yeah. You mentioned, you know, religion earlier. I mean, there's a biggie. How on earth do we get the entire world to understand what Mahatma Gandhi said, which is God has no religion? That's right. That's I mean, right. What do you see happening there? Because we all know where we've been with religion. We yeah. all know where we're at <laughs> with religion. Yeah. I know. religion. You know, where do we go from here? I think it's really, I think, you know, that's one of the conversations I've been waiting for for 45 years. Um, the book by Mauro Bellino and, or books and writings, I think has created that crack in the cosmic yes. religious egg. And, yes. um, and then the interview by George Cataneo, Georgie Cataneo in the Naked Bible, and then all of the work by Paul Wallace. Oh my, oh my gosh. Um, those have been the first um, you who wake up call. And even though some people have been really upset because their religion has been turned over topsy turvy, I have had message after message from people who have said, thank God this is coming up. Thank God the guy that they say doesn't, you know, isn't in the Bible, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we're at a point where we're beginning to understand that there has been a massive, massive global disinformation campaign in every aspect of life. And, and religion is maybe at the heart of all of that, because if you can control what people are doing with their consciousness, and that is exactly what the Catholic Church did, to just point out one of the religions, that church decided that you needed to examine your conscience every night and you needed to go to church and confess your sins and you needed to believe this and believe that and they made most of it up and they twisted the truth that was there and it, it's it's become a big mess it's a big mess right now um but i think we will sort that out um consciousness research and, and, you know, people like myself who have literally experienced that Godhead will stand up and say, you don't need the religion. You need the understanding that you are made of God. God stuff, I call it. Um, that when you've had a full-blown Kundalini experience, that is literally... A, a massive sudden shift of consciousness into the God state. And there's nothing there. There's no reality there except for these little pinpoints of light, utter silence, and this love like you cannot imagine. And that love is what you're made of, that light, that silence, and that love. And so we we get a body because consciousness creates a body. You talk about religion. The, the church has uh, for a long time said that uh, Jesus is your savior and, and that he was put to death and he rose from the dead. So you have to believe that if you're a good Catholic. Okay, so in religion, what you know, or in, in reality, when you've been into the God state and you come back from that, you are forever changed. And what you know is that consciousness creates the body. And if you've been out of the body, which I've been out of the body lots of times, um, that's part of just research into consciousness. What you discover, if you stay out long enough, you're going to create a body. And if you've had a kundalini experience, then you're kind of in charge of your own consciousness and you can resurrect yourself, quote unquote, 
as a new body in that new reality. And that's just one of the factors that is. And, and so the, and the other thing I would say is that when in the ancient days, before the days of the patriarchy, when there was a matriarchy, um, one of the big focuses of life before the matriarchy became corrupt was to develop human consciousness and all of the power and potential in each human. And so the queens, we didn't have presidents, we had queens, um, they would watch their people in their group for who's waking up, who's had this full-blown experience. And they had a lot of ceremonies and rituals and technologies to develop that that higher consciousness. And when you entered into a full Kundalini experience, that was called entering the Jesus state. And you would then had this title of Jesus. You were a Jesus. It was a title that you used or that was given to you. And you were now a teacher, a healer, um, you know, lots of a visionary, a builder, a, a, an inspired artist. You could communicate with animals, all of those things. And, and so that concept of becoming a Jesus was taken by the patriarchy and turned into a person. And, and the person was then you know, somebody had, a, I think somebody had a full-blown Kundalini experience. Um, and, and he was the one who was crucified. And because he had developed his ability, he came back because consciousness automatically creates a body wherever it goes. And you do that every night when you dream, you leave the body. And within a short time, you're having a dream somewhere in which you are having a full-blown physical-like experience. There's you're, you're already practiced at creating bodies. And you'll do that three or four times a night, depending on how many dreams you have. And, and so the, the church took this concept of becoming a Jesus and personified it. And there were big arguments, big arguments between the Gnostics and other religions of that mm -hmm. time that said, why are you ruining this whole thing? This is about human development. This is about consciousness becoming the full human or entering into full human potential. And, and so there were lots of arguments. There were lots of people that were murdered or killed or burned for declaring that, no, they weren't going along with that new program. And, and so here we are today with this idea that there was only one Jesus and really every human is supposed to enter that state. And the whole idea of resurrection, of consciousness creating a body was embodied in the resurrection concept. Jesus died and rose from the dead. Um, so we have this story that has been concocted and the whole thing is about to come apart. However, it will be replaced by a truth that is so much more exciting and so much more valuable and so much more personal to the individual. And I've, I've been teaching for 45 years, teaching people how to develop their consciousness. And what I have observed over and over and over again, is once people get an idea that there's more inside of them than they were taught, they, they latch onto that, and that yes. becomes the most exciting journey of their life. Yes. It's all the hero journeys. Yeah. And that's what awaits us. Yeah. I'm going to have to hold you there, Penny, because we have to go to a break. But keep that train of thought. We'll come back to it. You're okay. listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. And my guest today is publisher, teacher, consciousness researcher and author Penny Kelly. And we're talking about her latest book, The Revival, Path to a New Earth, New Human, which addresses the paradigm shift now occurring on our planet and the wonderful opportunities it presents to change our consciousness, make new decisions, and create a new world and a new human. We'll be back with more from Penny after this break. 
Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Om Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Om Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Om Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Om Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times flagship radio show, What is Going On? And as an author, editor, and 13 times book judge who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked what's really worth reading and what's not. So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees, and no BS, just an ever growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favourite authors and teachers plus free book excerpts, audios and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club, get inspired and save money at the no BS spiritual book club.com. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Penny Kelly, I was speaking to a friend the other day and talking about Paul Wallace's books and all of his research into the Bible. And my friend said, um, oh goodness, you know, what are people going to do when they realize that the deity that they had been worshiping um, was an ET? <laughs> oh, so, forgive me for laughing. <laughs> Um, what did you say when you, when that question came up? Could you even answer that? Yeah, well, it's, it's you know, I mean, it just stops people in their tracks, doesn't it? Yes. You know, yes, and, it does. and then, then they've either got to go with the idea, expand their thinking to embrace the possibility, or they've got to shut down. I know. Yeah. I know. It's been really... Um, it's been difficult for me to even answer that. I've had a couple of those. Well, what about the ET factor? Um, yeah. So what what Paul is revealing in, in Morrow as well, um, he doesn't really come right out and say blah, 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 but he, he's pretty clear that this Elohim is not the yeah. transcendent God. And and maybe he does say that directly. I haven't, I don't read Italian, so I haven't read all of his books. But I think the thing that has to be brought in, and, and almost as two separate kinds of issues, the religious thing is one set of issues for some people, and the ET is another set of issues for other people. What my experience has been is understanding from the minute Kundalini happened in 1979, I was aware that there were others here and much more. I could say much more about that, but that's maybe a different conversation. But the thing that is, that's really critical 
is that my understanding of God blew up. My old understanding that I graduated from a Catholic school. I was Catholic my whole life. I was still practicing. And all of a sudden, it was this understanding that, wow, you know, whatever that that thing is that I've been thinking was God, that just, poof, gone in that first kundalini experience. And, and the succeeding ones just reaffirmed that. And and I, I think what we need to do or we need to understand is that part of the reason for the what I'm going to call the control of consciousness and the dumbing down of our population so that we did not reach our full potential. We did not have the expanse of consciousness that we are designed to develop, to unfold. Um, is been because there is a very sneaky uh, takeover in process. Now, this gets into some things that people might not be familiar with and might not want to hear, but you can't help but know this once your consciousness is opened all the way. And, and the bottom line is that there is an attempt in process, in progress, to take over the planet Earth. And and there's, I'm, maybe I could say that, I've never read any science fiction, so, um, but I've heard, I've heard stories about science fiction. So our understanding of our planet and our place in this solar system and in this galaxy is very parochial. It is very immature. It's very naive. And the bigger picture, the bigger issue is that there are lots of other beings, three dozen other types of humanoids here, either in, on, or above the planet. And some of those are not good. We'll say that much. And they have been slowly trying to take over. There's a whole story behind that. It's very interesting. It goes back. Um, the big push came right before World War II, uh, maybe World War I, but in the early 1900s. Um, to, okay, we've been working this plan for the last 500, maybe a couple thousand years at least. Um, you know when consciousness opens, you know how these things are done, how takeovers are set up. That's a whole story in itself. And and the and we're at the crux of the moment, if I can say it that way, a crucial kind of moment in understanding that somebody's trying to take over and all of the <laughs> conspiracy theories about we're becoming slaves and we're becoming uh, what is that? My grand, uh, my grandson calls them zombies. You, you know, the world is full of of zombies, Grandma. And I'm like, well, I really can't argue. <laughs> so, um, and, and there's and there's a reason for that takeover, and there's a plan, and it involves billionaires and off planet dealings and trading and all kinds of stuff that would be in the realm of science fiction. If I had learned about that in my 20s, I would have just completely thought that was ridiculous. I would have completely ignored it. But when you come to know it firsthand, then it's a different matter. And, and so the ET thing is complicating the religious thing, which is complicating the governmental thing and all the rest. Whether you're talking about education, science, medicine, arts, yeah. Uh, business, technology. Uh, if you look around, you will see all the signs. You have to put those together. You can't say, well, that's just this or that's just that. When you put them all together, then you have a whole picture. And I did a couple times, I have talked about that bigger picture, but it's so hard for people to get their mind around that that it's like okay a little bit at a time <laughs> yeah 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 you got people have got to have certain experiences along the way and right you know, yeah yeah and, 
And if they haven't had those experiences, then it's just a story. It's, it's just a story. A yeah. scary story. Yeah. They don't want to read. Yeah. 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 It's not real. No. No. Yeah. And and uh, unfortunately, it is real. And and it is very important that people wake up. And I think we're going to probably spend the next two, three, maybe four or five years um, piecing it all back together, the real truth, the real history, the real religion, or the real worship, or the real whatever you want to call that, uh, the real spirituality, the mm -hmm. real science, the real food. Um, all of that is going to have to be redone, rebuilt, reorganized, etc. cetera. Um, and there's, I, I'm, we really need, even if the people who don't believe, don't want to think that any of that is true, we really need that their consciousness here as well. Um, sometimes they're referred to as sheeple. I might have said this last time we talked, but it bears repeating again. You need the bulk of people who just go along with whatever is happening because they solidify and hold steady the the people that are saying, hey, this is where we have to go. This is what we have to do. So it's, um, hang on a second here. I'm getting all kinds of interruption. Hang on. Interference? Yeah. My phone is trying to be answered. Um, oh, he gave up. Okay. <laughs> my computer is trying to answer my phone. So, whoops. Um, are you there? I'm still here. Okay. Hang on. I lost you. Don't lose this, Penny. Okay. Well, sitting on the edge of their seats right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I can't, I can't see you, but um, so let's see here. I had a bunch of things open and that's, you know, when I was setting up my phone, this is the wonderful thing about technology. Um, the, it said, do you want to connect all your stuff? And I'm like, okay, yeah, well, that <laughs> has not been a good idea. So, okay, sure. um, okay so let's go back to here, Chrome there. <laughs> okay, we're back. <laughs> we're back, we're back. Okay. Um, we've only got about uh, 12, 13 minutes. I would like to briefly touch on money and finance and we can go deeper into that in another conversation but just a little bit because i think so many people are so worried about their financial stability right now that yeah. you know what can you say that's going to give people some you know okay. idea that there's a light at the end of the tunnel here um yeah there is there is and i'll say some conflicting things because I think it's important to hold those paradoxical concepts. Um, number one, you do need to be worried about your money. That's just, and I'll say that um, just the other day, yesterday, I had, I gave myself directions to have a dream the night before. And I wanted to know, okay, when is the um, stuff going to hit the fan? kind of Which thing you've been waiting for, for a long time and i had in my head war and finances and and when is that going to become obviously a problem i mean it's already a problem here in the u.s and and i went to sleep and i had a dream it was very brief and i saw a calendar and you know how a calendar has all these little squares with a date in each one or a number and i'm looking at this calendar and out falls three of those little squares, February 5th, February 8th, and February 11th. And I thought, oh, dear. And the worst one was the 11th and following that. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> so um, we may see some really serious difficulties um, hitting the fan in the next week. Having said that, and the, yes, there is a need to be concerned, um, I'm going to say this. I'm also aware, and I, this has held steady for months, 
a um, couple of years because people have been talking about the financial crash for two years now. Um, what I see when I tune in to the powers that want to be, that they, the last thing they want, they keep trying to figure out, can we do this without crashing the financial system? Can we have a smooth changeover, a smooth landing? They sometimes call it a soft landing. And just a, a week or so ago, Janet Yellen was on YouTube saying, oh, yeah, we're, we have, we're going to have a soft landing. And I thought, oh, okay, they do not want to crash that because that's their last hope of being able to maintain control. So here we have this system that is absolutely corrupt and the people running it not wanting to crash it. And we need to crash it if we want to get rid of the controllers. And that, and so for those who are afraid, um, stop being afraid. You know, get do a little bit of prep, and count on your fellow human. This is an opportunity for us to step into love and care, and realize that we don't have to listen to all their attempts to divide us. We can come together. We can take care of one another. We can make sure things happen. And in fact, when I was with the little men in brown robes, they said more than once, your people who run your electric companies, your people who run your internets and your uh, food systems and your whatever, you know, is vital for the greater humanity will take it upon themselves and, and sort of, <laughs> this is not the way the little man of brown robe said it, but they would give the finger to the corporations and say, we're doing this, whether you give us permission or not, we're running this, people need this. And they sort of took over and it was kind of chaotic. It was very chaotic. And we did lose some people, but a lot of people made it and began to realize why were we not taking our own inner authority and our right to take care of ourselves to defend ourselves. Why didn't we see this issue as a need to defend ourselves? And, and so there's a change coming, big change coming, and it's a wonderful change for the humans. Maybe not so for every single one, but for those that are willing to say, yeah, I'm on board with something else. It is a wonderful change. It's messy, but it still results in some good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff happening now, you know. Um, uh, Sarah McCrum and her um, organization, they're working with people in Australia and investors in a whole new way, investi investing in regenerative farming, um, yeah. in, you know, investing in the small farmers. And, yep. you know, once upon a time, we all, re certainly in England, you know, we all yep. relied on the corner shop. And that corner shop took care of the people in the community yep. in more ways than one. And I think we have to kind of go back to, to look, you know, looking local, looking yep. at what is happening and looking at the small suppliers as well and looking That's after right. them. Yeah. yeah, that actually is one of the questions. I do a tarot reading for the world <laughs> once a month and it just came out today, I think. And, and that was one of the questions. What, what can the cards tell us about food systems in the Western countries? And, and basically what I drew was a two of swords, which is a card that says it's already been decided. And, and there's much more in that card, but what has already been decided? You need food. If you have a body, there is no other choice. You will have to take action. And, and it, they talk in the card about a vivid peace. That vivid peace is the peace of mind that comes when you take action. It's not just automatically granted to you. So it's a card that says, look, it's a given that you have to have food and you need to take action. And there, the warning that goes with that card is this is a critical issue. Begin putting the pieces together figure out how to handle or manage this situation locally. And it's all about local. Two is about relationships. 
So, yeah, mm -hmm. we're right there. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, sure. money is such a huge thing in our lives and we all rely on it and we all do things that we don't want to do in order to have it because that is the currency. But, yep. you know, if we were to go back to how it used to be when, you know, know. We, we worked the land yep. in order to have the food, not yep. in order to have lots and lots of money, I but know. to have our food <laughs> and survive. Yeah. And people thrive that way. I know. I grew up that way. We had a family of eight when there was just our family, but we always had some other family that was living with us, sometimes as many as um, eight or nine other people. And we fed everybody with that huge, huge garden that we maintained. And that was our life. And no food. You didn't help in the garden. No food. You, you weren't going to eat. And we had enough, but all of our trading, we didn't have a grocery store. Um, and so we had connections with farmers and people mm -hmm. had orchards and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, one of my first jobs was picking peppers, bushels of peppers. I could pick 20 bushels of peppers after school before five o'clock. And, um, you know, beans, green beans, you got 75 cents a bushel for green beans. You only got 25 for peppers. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that that was how we lived. And that that kind of relationship is coming back to some extent. And people are going to be growing a lot of food inside their house. The technology for that is coming into its own. It's beautiful technology and you need high nutrition and, and that's what you can grow inside the house in the form of microgreens or, you know, or even just have two chickens in the backyard and get some eggs. So yeah, lots and lots of changes coming. Uh, once we recognize that we really can do it better ourselves instead of relying on somebody else. And there's a lot of people who are bored with life and it doesn't have much meaning. And so what do they do? They watch TV all the time or they watch videos all the time. And, and they don't feel like they fit or they, they don't feel like they belong. That's about to change. And there's a huge um, wave of energy. We, we've all heard about the galactic wave of energy coming from the center of the, the mm. galaxy. I see this huge wave of energy coming from people in the Western countries as they take charge of their own food. So yeah. it's like, yeah, we're not messing with that. We'll do it ourselves. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, there are many other sectors in your book that you talk about. I'm, I'm particularly interested in technology and medicine yeah. and health and education because they are so important. Oh, yes. Maybe in episode three we can talk about those but the other thing that I just want to plant the seed in your mind that um, we have to talk about at some point <clears throat> and that is you know you you claim that we can't know where we're going if we don't know where we've been and yeah. um, you know it's, I think that to talk about our history and our origins and some of oh. the forces that are trying to affect our thinking going a little bit deeper into that on oh, another wow. episode would be um okay very interesting. yeah i always hated history until after my mother died right before she died she said history was my favorite subject in school and i was like blah <laughs> and then after she died, there was my, it was like the rug was pulled out from under my whole life and I could not do anything but cry for a year. And then um, I got into history and started discovering the real history. The real and history. It's a mind blower. Yeah. 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 I mean, the history we're taught in schools is the history that was created by the victors, you know. Um, yes. The real history is beginning to emerge now with so oh. many archaeological sites showing, yep. you know, changing yep. how old people oh. think the world is, etc. Yep. Um, that's that's the real history and that's the yeah. exciting stuff. It yeah. is. It really is. That's a wonderful topic for 
probably more than one conversation, but um, it's something that I think we need to dig into um, so that we can see where do we want to go? How do we want to be? What can we become? And there's, there's the question of the day. We are becoming something else, and we have to do that by choice, not yes, by yes. default or by accident. Yeah. Yeah, Penny, it's always um, never enough time when we talk, always. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, let's organize um, part three. Okay, will do. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody who sees this. Think about where we're going. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Yeah. yeah. So the revival, Path to a New Earth, New Human by Penny Kelly, is published by Lily Hill Publishing. For Fair more enough. information about Penny's books, videos, courses, online classes and events, visit her website at pennykelly.com. And if you prefer the flexibility of listening to viewing, this show is also available as a downloadable podcast on Spotify, iTunes, On Times Radio and all other major podcast platforms. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Until then, it's goodbye from me and thank you, Penny Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>